the regular board meeting for the Board of Election Commissioners for the City of Chicago. Good morning. My name is Maricel Hernandez. I am the chairman. Seated to my left is Commissioner Jonathan Swain, and to my right is Commissioner William Cressy. Today is March 22nd, uh, 9.05 a.m. Uh, the next item on the agenda is the consideration of the agenda. Are there any changes to the agenda? If not, we will proceed with the approval of the minutes for the regular board meeting of March 8th, 2016. Do we have a, a motion to approve? So moved. Second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Board meeting minutes for March 8th is approved. Uh, uh, next is the special board meeting minutes for March 15, 2016. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion approved. And lastly, uh, the minutes for the Canvas Board meeting for March 15, 2016. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Okay, motion approved. Next on the agenda is the Executive Director's Report, Mr. Goff. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, before I start, I would like to thank the board members for the support on this last election. As you know, it wasn't uh, the prettiest one, but we've got it done. We're still counting. I do not have a report yet because we're still working on a canvas and other items. We still have absentees to still be counted. But I wanted to thank uh, Ms. Bateman. Uh, I want to thank Jim Scanlon. I want to thank you too, Joan Agnew. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Jim Allen for all the support they've gave, given me, plus my managers, assistant managers, the entire staff. It was incredible. Uh, I do not want to call out a lot of people at this time because our staff watches these uh, proceedings and they look to see if they were mentioned or not. But uh, there are some people that do need to be recognized. On Monday, uh, we had the last day for early vote. We had lines stretched all the way downstairs in the lower level, all the way to the Daily Center. Uh, I ran down there at, I had a meeting, I ran down there at 7.10, 7.15, went down there and found out the line was gone. Uh, Charles Holliday and Dawn uh, Downs worked together and got that line all out to have a uh, you know, roughly 3,000 people vote in a small area, and they were able to get the lines out a couple of minutes after 7 o'clock was incredible, and that needs to be recognized. Um, Matthew Lynn, this was his first election as acting manager of the uh, IT department. I think things went well. We still have to have a debriefing. Steve Sislicki, this was his first time as taking over vote by mail. He did a very good job. We still have to debrief him on that part. And somebody, this was her first time, Paulina, who did the election coordinators, did an excellent job. I never thought we would have 100 complete filled. She had 200 extra ones that we used them as standbys also. So these people really did a great job. But all the staff, all your managers, all of our translators, our community outreach folks, everybody did a real good job. But there's some things that we need to work on and I need to start right now. One of the items is, as you saw in the election administration report, we had a very, very hard time with the United States Post Office this election. The lack of postmarks, we had, uh, I did go with the intelligent barcode, people thought it was a waste of money but thank God we did. We found out that there were ballots over at the post office that they said, no, there aren't. We had to call a congressman up, have the congressman's office call the post office, and that day we got 30 tubs of ballots. This can never happen again. I just want to let the board members know. So we're going to meet with the post office right after, uh, before this election ends, just to let you know, because Jim Allen and I were discussing. We don't know if we need to go to Carol Streams to pick up our mail. It's just not working. So that's one item that we need to work on right away. The other item is that for early vote, 
has turned out to be a huge, a huge success. The problem is that we have laptops, and at that time we used to have the laptops program our cards. Found out that the state board said we have to have a VISTAL report and it has to go through the state board to get approval to do it. So what we've done is we put in the person's address, it comes out with the ballot style, and you have to punch it into the hat and then program the card that way. We found out some people, the hats are, were slow, it was just not moving fast enough. So that's one item that I'm going to start working on right now, getting the fiscal report. Uh, there are two uh, testing companies, I'm going to meet with them, and we're going to get this done as soon as possible because we need that done for this upcoming November election. And last is early vote. 140,000, and I've always said that one of these days the bucket's going to overflow. Well, it was almost overflowing for this election. Early vote is, a, is people like it. If they vote early vote the first time, they usually come back. It's 140,000. The size of our locations are too small. We use 51 sites. They are absolutely too small. I'd like to meet within the next week with the park district, with uh, the libraries, the university, the police stations that we use. We need to get larger spaces. We need to get more employees. And for this, this last election, I had investigators. We have investigators go out when we see problems. I had to hire additional investigators. I'm gonna have to have 25 investigators on standby. So these are the things that we need to work on right away. We need to hire additional bodies out at these early voting sites. The six and seven people that we have, they worked out for this election. The problem is that the next election, this ballot is gonna be larger. This ballot, this election, the primary, the six pages, six screens. This one coming up for November, 16 screens. So, and somebody takes five minutes to vote a ballot, it's gonna take them 10 to 15 minutes to vote an entire ballot. We, we need to get some more spaces. And, you know, I, I would like to say, once you give it, you can't take it away. Um, we have early voting on Monday till seven o'clock at night. It kills your employees. You have to get those memory chips back in to the office and they were working until 2 o'clock in the morning and then have to start all over again at 5. So these are the things that we really need to take a closer look. And I want to try to get some super sites. We need some sites like the United Center when I can put up 100 pieces of equipment, have 30 or 40 people out there, have free parking. I mean, I think this is something that we need to start taking a real hard look at what we're doing for November. We, we don't have time to do vote centers, but the early vote's gonna be the next thing to a vote center. So I just wanted to let the board members know that these are the items that we need to work on right now in order to have a successful November election. I, I mean, I, I totally agree, especially when it comes to um, having a large enough sites, and I know how, how um, what a challenge it's been. Um, but um, I think if we start now and, and try to take care of it and reserve those spaces, um, you know, I, that would be the best, the best thing, you know, for us. So. Um, Your question for clarity. Um, Mr. Goff, so when you say larger sites, are you, is implicit in that more machines? Yes. Okay. Yes. Just wanted to clarify. You know, we, uh, the King Center where you, you went to, to vote, early vote. We had uh, 15 pieces of equipment there. They do a huge turnout at the King Center. They're always in the top 10, the 19th ward. I mean, they're always in the top 10. We need additional equipment. With a 16-page okay. ballot, you'll... <laughs> Got it. So this idea is getting larger centers for more people exactly. and more equipment. And more yes. equipment. Okay. Um, have we given any thought to look at some of the sites that, uh, based on the numbers, that are not uh, producing? I know there are a couple sites where uh, the, the the numbers are abnormally low, or maybe moving them, moving them to different locations to get some kind of relief a bit. 
you know, I, I want to make sure that I have a site in every ward. Sure. Uh, there are some sites that do not put in the numbers, but that last week, every site almost had a line. Okay. Uh, the 17th ward, uh, it was not an issue until Monday when there was a, a block and a half long line out of that, that one site. So people tend to wait to the last mm -hmm. moment, you know, last day to vote. What we needed to anticipate that. And, and I spoke to several elected officials or people that are out in those areas. They're going to help us get additional sites. But I think I may have to increase the 51 sites. I don't know any other way of, I, I'm looking at over 200,000 early votes for this upcoming election. And with what we have right now, that would just bring us down to our needs. No, clearly. Um, to the last point of the, uh, how you say you giveth and can't take it away. So uh, not about the Monday, which is, which is understandable. But uh, if we expand to 51, would the thought be, because I know turnout for this election expected, is expected to be very high. Um, for elections where we don't project the turnout to be that, would the idea be to scale back? Yes. Or would it be to keep it how we? No, I, th I, think, I think we have to look at what type of elections that okay. we're doing. I will never underestimate where we saw some of our people in other locations ran out of ballots. We'll never run out sure. of ballots, I promise you that. Problems, the problem is that you have to anticipate where we're going to be getting lines, and that's what I need to start okay. working on. And, and luckily, because of the last several elections, we have a grid. We can look at where we're going to get hit and where we're not going to. But I have to tell you, between early voting and the postal service, those are two things that we rely on, and we need to work on what the problems are worth. So, like I said, I don't have a fully debriefed meeting with my staff yet. Um, after we do that, I'll give you our pluses and our minuses, mm -hmm. things that we did well, things that we didn't. We need to talk to our vendors because there were things that went well, things that didn't go well. So we're going to start working on that right away. So I just want to let the board members know I will give you more in-depth analysis of this election after we, we do all of our debriefing. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Goff, if, if I may just go on the record uh, to also commend you and your staff uh, for the outstanding job. As you know, I worked Election Central for over 20 years before coming on the board here, and I don't recall many, if any, elections where we didn't have to get a court order to hold a polling place open past the closing time. And uh, we did not have that this year, and I think that's quite a quite a uh, accommodation uh, for you and your staff. And uh, when you consider some of the problems that other jurisdictions had with their voting this time in the state of Illinois uh, for the city of Chicago, with the incredible turnout that we had to uh, handle it, uh, it was great. We, as you know, I, I had a few calls on situations where not all the materials were on display, you know, at, at the, at the uh, particular precinct, but other than that, I think we did an outstanding job. And I'm happy to hear your your ideas for the future because, as you know, I also went and visited a few of the early voting sites, and you have something like the 13th Ward, which is a very busy ward in a very small space, and that's going to have to change. One question. the uh, did it? Did we get a very large turnout the weekend before election day? We always do. We always do. That Saturday is always a big turnout. But then having then Sunday and Monday right. at those 14 sites just really strained the resources of this office. So, so as you're thinking that maybe on Saturday and Sunday before elections, where we have these super sites that. I think, United Center and other places I think like that's that. what we may have to look into um, because there are too many people. There's no parking at a lot of our sites. We're in the city of Chicago. Parking's a premium. So we need to figure out where we have sites where I can have free parking. I mean, we have some sites up on the north side that we can use and some downtown. But it's something that needs to really be looked at. 
and we need to do it right now so we have it in place for November. So if we can meet with everybody, give them a calendar. This is the dates that we're going to be using this site. Um, so I'm just letting you know this is something that we've got to start right away. Thank you, sir. Well, thank you. And I join uh, Commissioner Cressy in um, thanking um, the staff. Um, they went above and beyond uh, as usual. And uh, all I can say is that they make us look good. Can I tell you something? I've never staff the hours that staff put in, you know, from 7 o'clock in the morning till 10, 11 o'clock at night for 10 days straight, mm -hmm. 20 days straight. This is just, you know, it's a dedicated staff. I'm very proud of them, all of them. So uh, I'll leave it at that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Baton? Good morning. Good morning. Um, I echo everything Mr. Groff said about our staff, uh, just unbelievable. Um, and Mr. Groff, of course, did a fabulous job. And I'm so impressed he didn't really have any notes either. <laughs> Amazing. Um, warehouse staff, phenomenal. Mm -hmm. You know, they're 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 not here. They're they're off site, but they just get the job done. Um, no questions asked. Um, but yes, everyone else: Dawn, Charles, Matt, Knight, the whole IT department, um, Audra, Rose Torres, in judges and community services, Polina, first mm -hmm. time election coordinator. Fantastic. Right. Um, and I talked to many of those election coordinators on election day, and they were very good. Yeah. Um, so um, we had over 5,300 calls placed into Election Central, logged, I shouldn't say placed, but logged into ASCAD on election day, so that's, that's quite a feat. Um, uh, still processing payrolls, hopefully the judge's payroll will be submitted this week, by the end of this week, same with election coordinators. Mm -hmm. um, so we have our post-election activities. We start the 5% tomorrow, which is a state-mandated uh, post-election test of the equipment. That's tomorrow with the warehouse, and that'll take a few days. That's election day and early voting equipment. So we're just moving forward. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Ms. Mr. Allen? Good morning. As you know, the city probably will have led the state even though all of the counties downstate and in the suburbs are reporting that this is a record turnout for them. Um, and this is probably only our, it'll be our sixth or seventh best presidential primary turnout. Neck and neck, you know, we'll end up around 52% or highest was like 56%. But uh, the voters came out really heavily toward the end there. Uh, was looking like we were only gonna be in the 40s temperature uh, turnout, uh, but then toward the very end, the numbers really started to pop. Uh, this is our first time with the uh, chairwoman's new polling place, which the media loved. It was Kaminsky School, Kaminsky School instead of uh, the VFW Hall at the old chairman's place. There's a lot more space than this uh, little cramped room, uh, and there are two precincts there. Uh, they really like that, in the auditorium, as you know, and uh, so thank you for uh, accommodating that. website uh, worked really well throughout the day. Um, we didn't have any complaints about people not being able to find their polling place in this. Of course, it was the first time we had election day registration and uh, between the website and uh, the call center here and the poll books, that part worked really well. Uh, better than many other jurisdictions. So uh, we don't have the final tally on those yet hope to be getting those soon. And then we're going to have to crunch the numbers because we know, for example, at Loyola, they had far more use there. So we're, we're and this is exactly what Milwaukee election officials told us, where you have large numbers of students up there at Bradley University, uh, I'm sorry, Marquette um, University, and then in high rental areas where there's more turnover that's where you're going to have your concentration. So as much as we had this election, uh, we're probably going to have three or four times as many in the general election in November. So there may be instances where we're going to have to look at having more equipment in precincts that fit those demographics. So now we've got at least a base of numbers <coughs> to look at. Uh, so we're going to try to predict out before November. Uh, there were, uh, I'm not
not sure if it was more complaints or if it was just we didn't have as many complaints in other areas about the split precincts and the wrong ballots. And so um, we're going to try to look at, at ways to try to make sure the judges poll uh, every ballot style out of those election supply carriers. Uh, generally, they did well, but in the places where they didn't, sometimes the early morning voters were handed the wrong ballots and then it was straightened out uh, after we got an investigator out there and they checked the election supply carrier and they got every. It's particularly troubling in a, um, not troubling, but difficult in a primary where you may not have just two ballot styles or three or four or five, but then you have two versions of each one of those, or in some places, three versions. So uh, that's a challenge that we're going to have to look at again. Um, to, I, I can't emphasize enough what Mr. Goff said. The Monday, 7 p.m. early voting, and I heard this from other election officials around the state, was extremely stressful on the staff. Because not only are they there until, because the polls won't close at 7 p.m. It's everybody who's in line. So many of these. Of sites did not actually close until 9, 9 30. So then you don't get the chips back from these places until 10, 10 30, 11 o'clock. So your, your early voting staff is there the night before they have to be here at 4 30 in the morning until 10, 11 midnight. And your technology staff, your information technology staff, is here until 1 in the morning trying to process this information and get this in. This is uh, proven stressful uh, for staff and for the technology, for not only for us, but everywhere across the street in the state. Um, so we're hopeful. He, you, know, you said they don't give, if they, if they give it, they don't take it away. Uh, but hopefully they can consider scaling that back because that nine to seven day of voting uh, the Monday before, 5 a.m. to midnight day. It's just too much for this day. It's just it's too much. Um, lastly, the media calls tended to focus on turnout. Uh, unfortunately, the, the media view did not work during the day uh, in connection with this offshoot of the poll books. Uh, it did not function at all. It, it, so it, 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 that problem got worse. Not better. So I'm a little concerned about that going forward because we've had five elections now. In the past, it hasn't worked properly. Uh, we're supposed to be able to access information on a real time basis, uh, but we're reviewing a lot of issues with the poll books um, um, with an eye toward trying to find some resolutions ahead of November. That's it. Okay, and we'll wait for uh, the uh, report um, on. Uh, poll books and, and other issues um, before we address anything. Um, I just have a couple of uh, questions that uh, I was reminded of. Is it uh, statutory the Monday before Election Day that we stay open till a certain time? Yes. yes. So it is statutory that we stay open till 7? Yes. So we will have to get some kind of change. Okay. Is there piggyback? Is it statutorily required how many we have open until 7? Permanent sites. It, it didn't say the number of sites. We were able to pick those sites. So we identified the 14 as permanent. Correct. But if we wanted... Okay, so we could identify 3 as permanent or 2 as permanent. It just depends on what we indicate as permanent. But we have to keep those permanent ones open on up until the Monday Sunday before. Monday. Yes. Sunday, Monday. Okay. The problem is that Thing. I didn't want to use 14 sites. Staff told me not to, but we did. If I thought we had less sites, we would have had more problems. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's something that I, we need to sit down and figure yes. out. But we could, if, if we did super sites, we could adjust the number of permanent sites because they can accommodate more people. And, it, and that's what we may have to do. Okay. My last uh, question is on the three college uh, sites. Yeah. How, how did they do? In they the did not do, they did not put in the numbers that we thought. The sites that they gave us were small, cramped, 
uh, there were a lot of negatives to those three universities. Mm. And I was very disappointed with that. We, we put a lot of work into that. We, and I thought by hiring the students to work at uh, like Peter, that they gave us the two sites we were able to hire students, correct? Nothing. Okay, so that needs to be really looked at. Okay. Um, next on the agenda is old business. Um, I don't think we have anything regarding infrastructure projects at this point um, or the electronic poll books um, or voting equipment or like the voting equipment. Nothing for this. Okay. Um, is there anything new regarding legislation that we As of right now. No. Okay. Um, do we have any new business? I don't believe so. And uh, do we have a legal report today? No. Okay. No, we, we do not have a financial report. That So that takes us to uh, the uh, public comment. And we have um, Claire Tobin. Um, Ms. Tobin? Hi. I sure. Here? Okay, and uh, just so you know, we have five minutes uh, limit basically on. Sure. Um, okay, I'm with um, Illinois uh, Ballot Integrity Project, and we're a small group, but we were able to recruit uh, quite a number of uh, poll watchers who we trained, and we got a lot of assistance from the board in terms of the nursing home voting, the books, the manuals, and everything. So, we, you know, we tried to do. Uh, our, our job and um, just briefly in general I would say we covered about 20 nursing homes which we kind of had uh, problems with uh, you know last year and I would say this time there was most more staff more uh, board of election people um, you know more state's attorneys the the investigators and everything so uh, there were less uh, regular you know assistance of uh, voters than there had been it was it was more orderly so that was that was nice they filled out the paperwork better too so I'd say that was an improvement um, then in, on election day we had volunteers poll watching in at least uh, 10 different wards and we <laughs> went around a lot and there did seem to be a problem with not enough judges showing up uh, there was a shortage of judges in a number of places and the other thing that we flagged on election day were uh, some precincts that had uh, a lot of provisional um, provisional voting, and um, I, you know, we kind of <laughs> found that early on. And I went to one place about 11 in the morning in the 47th ward at Wells Park, and I noticed there were like 17 provisionals. And I, there was one guy who was just voter provisional, so I went out after him and I asked him, you know, didn't you have your ID or whatever? He said, yes, I did. They didn't ask him if he had an ID or anything. They just said, you know. Uh, provisional so we went back in and you know we rectified that and then I tried to explain you know to the judges that um, that was unusual to have so many provisional ballots especially if people had ID so I think uh, for us that seemed to be a, a problem that the judges were not uh, sufficiently trained in um, the ID to prove your identity and prove your address that that was sufficient for, for same day registration, change of address, and then you get a regular ballot, and that definitely didn't didn't happen. Did, are you saying sufficient ID for voting or for registration? Because for voting, you didn't have to produce. Yeah, no, no. This was for if you had um, you know change of address, first time registration. Um, so you're saying that the judges were not requesting or did not receive sufficient identification? I'm just trying to understand. They didn't understand the requirements that uh, if you wanted to uh, register for the first time, change your registration, uh, you know, address or whatever, that all you needed was one piece of ID to set who you were and the other ID where you lived, your address. Uh -huh. So a piece of mail or whatever. And in addition, they were rejecting people with ID from out of state, like a driver's license from you know, Wisconsin, Indiana, Arizona. They said no, they wouldn't even ask for the address ID at all. Um, and so people were upset, and I had one, <laughs> one guy who told me 
that he had called the Board of Elections ahead of time to ask if his uh, Wisconsin driver's license and his you know, uh, address would be sufficient, and they said yes. But when he went into the polling place, and this was actually on the near north, um, they refused to give him. So he was a very sophisticated you know, um, voter who knew what, what his rights were, and so he was not, <laughs> he was upset about that. Um, and did anybody call Election Central regarding the large amounts of provisional voting? Yes, okay. I did talk to somebody in the registration department, I don't know if it was Charles or I, I forgot the name, and um, so, you know, he said he, he would, you know, make a note of it. I said, I asked him to alert the investigators so that they could make sure that that wasn't um, happening so much. Um, but um, the other thing, too, that, that he uh, informed me about as well, which we also experienced, was the problem with the poll book not accepting the 17-year-olds who were going to be 18 in November. And I, um, you know, that was all over the place, too. So he was aware of that when I, when I spoke with him. And, you know, we did see a lot of, a lot of students. So I think um, that problem is a problem that the vendor didn't, as he acknowledged, didn't program the poll book properly. So that really gave uh, a bad, <laughs> um, you know, when we had all these record turnout, all these young people involved, the real issues are being discussed. I mean, it affects their lives. So we really, this is very important that we don't lose those young people. I've been an activist for a long time, and I was always saying, where are all the young people? Why can't we get the young people involved? Now they're involved. Now we have to make sure that we don't, you know, shut Absolutely. them out. <laughs> and, well, um, thank you for all of these um, observations, and um, uh, we will um, definitely... Can I just mention one yeah. other thing? Another thing, too, that seemed to be widespread were people who were voting out of precinct on election day. Huge numbers. And it happened a lot in the 42nd Ward, downtown, the near north, and everywhere where there was major employment centers. So people are so stressed out with work, you know, they, they go to the, to, to the closest place. And then they're told, maybe, or maybe not, that they're out of precinct. So, um, we really think that uh, those voters who are out of precinct should be considered valid for, for the federal ballot. And I just wonder yeah. if you can check if we can make sure that happens. And make sure to that the provisionals um, who had their out-of-state ID, had to, sufficient ID. That also happened in the 39th Ward. There were a lot of young Hispanic voters. And um, they had their proper ID given provisional. So to that, you know, I just hope that that um, can be, um, you know, and, and I think that the poll book vendor, the 17-year-olds could have programmed the poll book to accept uh, people who were going to be 18 by November. So I would say that's grounds for getting a new vendor today. Okay. All right. Thank but you. thank you, though, for all the help that all the staff gave us in allowing us uh, to monitor, especially the provisional ballots. We were down there for two days and they were really, um, you know, they didn't mind us kind of asking questions and trying to understand how they were verifying the provisionals. Um, but anyway, okay. Thank you very Thank you. much. And we'll take your comments definitely into account in, in uh, preparing for the uh, November election. Oh, this one is. Okay. Yes. Next is uh, Don Olson. Don? Good morning, everybody. Uh, first, I'd like to just second what Claire said in that there were lots of problems with the provisionals. In fact, you know, we all thought that because of same-day voting, there would be fewer provisionals than ever, maybe very few at all. And in fact, there were more than ever. Uh, in the 33rd Ward, which I, or at least in the areas that I saw, I don't know what the citywide numbers are, but in the 33rd Ward, we had like about 33% more provisionals. And it was because of these problems with the uh, poll books. Um, the other thing, um, well, just one, one, I'll just say one more thing about the provisionals, because that's not really what I want to talk about today. Um, a lot of provisionals got put in the ballot box. Uh, they were not put 
so the voter wasn't instructed to come back to the judge, have the provisional put in the provisional envelope, and then put in the big provisional envelope at the end of the day. In one precinct that Claire monitored in the 40th Ward, uh, there were about 230 votes in the ballot box. 23 of them were at your um, provisional ballots. So, provisional ballots cannot be in the air. <laughs> But they do go through this. They do. Yes, they do. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, I, I I don't think that ward was typical, but in that ward or in that precinct, I mean, ten percent of the ballots in the ballot box were provisional okay. ballots. Now, uh, Mr. Scanlon made the decision at the um, warehouse recount the other day that these ballots were just going to be counted, and I'm wondering if Mr. Scanlon even has the uh, statutory authority to say that these non-qualified ballots will be treated as if they're qualified ballots. So, but, but I'm here to talk about absentee or uh, okay, uh, Because you have about mail three more minutes. Okay, and this is, this is short. Mm -hmm. I just did a little more research on mail-in ballots, and I noticed that uh, in the election code, that there's some confusion about this, so these things should be clarified. In Article 19, it says that they should be postmarked, quote, postmarked no later than election day. But also in another place in Article 19, it says they should be postmarked no later than midnight preceding election day. And I knew I had heard both of those before. But when you stop and think about it, um, midnight preceding election day is the only one that makes sense. Otherwise, people would be allowed to vote after the polls close. So it, it can't be midnight of election day. But that, so that being said, um, as far as poll watchers being allowed to uh, challenge signatures on absentees um, or on mail-in ballots, um, I discovered that you know here we have these different kinds of voting. One is uh, early voting, and poll watchers are allowed to challenge signatures. The other is election day, poll watchers are allowed to challenge signatures. And I discovered that in military mail and ballots, poll watchers are allowed to challenge signatures. So the only category where poll watchers are not allowed to challenge signatures is mail and ballots that are non military mail and ballots. And I think that it, it doesn't say in the statutes that poll watchers are not allowed to challenge the signatures on regular mail and ballots. It merely says that poll watchers can be present. But I think that the only um, interpretation of the law of them, since those three categories, you know, allow poll watchers to challenge signatures, can be, when it says poll watchers should be present, may be present, I think it should be interpreted, poll watchers may be present to do what poll watchers normally do. Um, and, and why are military mail-in ballots held to a higher standard than regular mail-in ballots? Because those people would have the, uh, presumably a harder time coming into the Board of Elections to validate the ballot since they're on a military post in Afghanistan. Um, so I think that we really, well, what I'm suggesting is that I think a vote of the board to just clarify this in light of the fact that these three areas. Well, yeah, and, and I appreciate that. I think that Mr. Scanlon um, um, will ask him to look at, at, at this um, uh, what you're pointing out as a possible discrepancy. Sorry, I didn't get that. And um, have Mr. Scanlon um, okay. uh, analyze it and give his opinion. Okay. You had mentioned at the last meeting possibly changing the statute, but in light of this new information about the military ballots, I would think that, I, I think that the statute should be clarified definitely. Okay. But I think that, uh, I, I would like the board to consider whether just a vote of the board would clarify this until the statute is changed. Thank you. Okay, thank okay. you. Um, and um, lastly, we have Laura Chamberlain. Yes, uh, from Chicago. Ms. Chamberlain, uh, we have five, about Okay, great. Five. I'm sorry I'm late. I was supposed to help present with Claire. Um, the red line is really messed up today. So I just, I didn't hear her entire presentation. Okay. But um, what, we are, we are ex extremely concerned about same day registration and then this, you know, this kind of massive provisional ballots that were given out. Um, a couple things that I wanted to say is the, 
the um, election judges need to be trained uh, to a far greater extent on same-day registration. We, we have many reports. We actually make calls to the voters. We had many reports where the same day uh, the election judges were telling the voters that um, you same day register, you have to vote provisionally. That's the law. Okay, many reports of that, and we're really that's really disconcerting to us. Uh, so the election judges need to really. And have, we will uh, clarify that for the next. Uh, exactly. Yeah. So um, and then number two, um, they need to be taught how to correct errors on the electronic poll books. A lot of people went in, changed their mind about a ballot style or, you know, corrected some of their information, and, and we had multiple reports that the election judges could not correct the poll books. They didn't know how, okay? Well, so, they can't change their ballot style. Yeah, they, they can. They, they can go out in. Not their style. They can change their party preference. They, they can, can choose okay. the, they can't change their ballot not style. The, not the ballot style. Yeah. But the party they chose. The party. Yes, okay. that did happen. That's, right. that's, okay. And that yes. happened a lot. But not only that. They would go in and there was something wrong in the poll book, some piece of information that was wrong. They, uh, we got many reports. The voters said they could not change it at the, at the, um, the polling place. The election judges did not know how to correct the poll book. Information like what? Um, their date of birth, their address, if they made a mistake, they would go, oh, no, there's a mistake. And the judges said they didn't know how to correct it. Okay. If they took a Republican ballot and they wanted to switch to Democrat, they couldn't go back and correct it. Hold on a second. Did you have a question? Data yeah, yeah, multiple multiple pieces of information were not allowed to be corrected at the poll book. Because the, the, the only, it was for registration, same day registration included a name change or address change. Right. So not date of birth change. If the, if the, ad, if the voter noticed something was off, they asked for it to be corrected, and for some reason, the judges couldn't correct the e-books. We and that was that was intentional. We don't want the judges to have the access to change things in a voter's record. We have a form that we that we use where they where the judges are to include any mistakes, misspellings, or anything like that to a voter's record, and then we take. Our registration department takes a look at those forms post-election and but, correct whatever. But then sometimes the um, the ID, so a voter would present ID, and they would say, well, it's not the same address, or it's not the you know the the information in the poll book, and they would say, well, let's correct it here. Here's all my ID, and and then they were given provisional ballots. Okay. <laughs> uh, so Do you I think we, we, yeah, we addressed okay. the, the problem with the provision of giving out the provisional right. ballots, right? But there's, I think that there needs to be some way for the voter information to be changed at the, um, at the. Uh, but you understand, you, you understand that we, we, we have judge, t over ten thousand judges of election out there, and we don't want there's only certain information that can be changed. You understand that okay. because. It's very sensitive information, and I we understand. need to make sure that it's done appropriately. You know, any other information changed but by if, the appropriate person. But if it's personnel. off you know, on election day in the poll book, that it, and the voter has some ID to prove it, then the voter ID has to trump what's in the poll book. Well, then, that then, then, then the possibility happened. is that we vote. The person votes provisionally, just to make sure. Well, we're really concerned. And, about and I, I understand that, yeah. but okay. So um, the, you know, I don't know if Claire had figured out all her percentages, but we clearly are seeing that um, it's anywhere from 50 to 80 percent of the provisionals were given incorrectly uh, this election cycle. So we're going to be watching these really, really closely for how many are counted. I want to make it a personal appeal. The judges were not telling the um, voters their correct precinct. And in fact, a lot of times, they, and we got this directly from conversations with the voters, a lot of times they would say to the voter, oh, just vote provisional. It's built. It'll be counted. You don't have to go to your precinct, your correct precinct. Just vote provisional. It'll be counted. And that is incorrect information. But the voters were given that information. We got many reports of this. So I would make a personal appeal, and I don't know if this is possible, that um, any uh, provisional ballot that was voted out of precinct be counted for the federal offices. Well, is that possible? If I may, uh, a couple of things about provisional ballots. We've had elections where we had 23,000. We're barely at 10. So it's, 
it would be inaccurate um, uh, to suggest that this election saw a dramatic increase. It would be wildly inaccurate. Um, secondly, a provisional ballot that is cast out of precinct uh, but uh, is within the right jurisdiction, meaning the city of Chicago, uh, that voter's choice is for president, U.S. Senate, Congress, if they're in the right district still. So if they live in a north side district but they voted south side, that won't work. But if they're somewhere within the right congressional district, if they're somewhere within the right state senate district, if they're somewhere within the right state representative district, all of those choices will count. And as well as seat. as well as all of their countywide uh, choices for uh, in this contest, recorder of deeds, circuit court clerk, and state's attorney. Uh, the exceptions are board committeemen, uh, uh, judicial positions, and the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District. So the law has been changed uh, to allow us to uh, not outright uh, deny all of the selections. Right. Where possible, we can count some of the selections. Right. Okay, that's good. That was my ma major question. And I didn't say that this was the most number of provisions we have ever gotten. But it seemed to be very targeted to the youth, to same-day registration, which was very uh, youth-oriented, lots of new voters. Well, this is the first time we had same-day registration. 17 year olds, yes. Right. But we, are, we don't want to disenfranchise them in their uh, first We don't want to disenfranchise around. anyone. Right. Um, I, don't, and I don't think they were disenfranchised. I think all of them have the opportunity to vote. Well, let me tell you about a couple of other well, things. Well, let me, let me, well, fin let me finish my comment. Yeah. Um, as I'm, as I, correct me if I'm wrong. <clears throat> there was a technological glitch with the electronic poll books, Correct. but no one was uh, uh, disenfranchised in any way. They were all given the ability to register via paper and to vote. Correct. Correct. Okay. I just want to. I just want to play. Well, well, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not disagreeing that that yeah. that we had some issues and those issues need to be addressed. I'm not going to disagree with you on yeah. that. But when you use the term disenfranchisement, I want to make sure they we use it. Well, if they have the ability to vote, they necessarily weren't disenfranchised. So um, I just want to be specific about that point because you raised it, so I want to address it. Only but if the vote is counted. That's a, that. A, absolutely, I don't disagree with that. But yeah. what I'm saying to you is, I want to make sure that all 17 year olds were have, did have the ability to cast their ballot, and they will be. Yeah. The provisions. Okay. But let me tell you about the same day registrations. So it was okay. it was we're, widely popular. Uh, I, it's only one more minute. I know. I'm just saying Some one of you more minute. at the table took my time. Well, no, so, we have, um, we have one more minute. Okay, so, so this, it, was so, it was very widely popular, especially around the colleges. Um, at Loyola University, they ran out of same-day registration forms at 3 o'clock. And there were voters disenfranchised. We counted at least 35 voters that walked away. And because did, did anybody call the election central? Yeah, we were calling for two hours to get uh, new forms. They didn't arrive till about 5.30. So, um, and that was just at one precinct po po polling place in, you know, around the universities. So I would hope that the um, board would take that into account the next election and, and distribute same-day registration forms very, you know, liberally, you know, 200, 250, okay. so that we don't do that again. Mr. Allen, did you want to mention something? That was a, we made a reference to Loyola University specifically earlier in the meeting, and uh, one of the issues there as well was that uh, students were going to the site close to the campus to many of the buildings there. They were not going to their precincts where they actually reside. So uh, there's a little voter education component that goes there too, where we're gonna try to uh, get voters to the right polling places instead of just having them go to the nearest one from their last class. Yeah. Right. Well, there's, always, there's a lot of lessons to be learned from this first day, of, uh, first time of uh, election day registration. We are the same two blocks away, three blocks away from Washington College. Um, and, and at least there, they could instruct the individuals to come here um, to register and to vote. But there, there are two polling places, two precincts at Harold Washington, and they had the same issue where they had people who were not in either one of those precincts, but they were attempting to register and vote there. And they were trying to get them to come here. Um, so. um. Thank you. Uh, next item on the agenda is executive session. Is there a motion for executive session? No, ma'am. Okay. Um, at this time, is, uh, is there a motion to adjourn? Yes. Yeah.
to our next, uh, it, Mr. Goff, is, do we need a meeting for next uh, Tuesday the 29th? I think that's when we proclaim on the 5th. Uh, we proclaim the on the 5th. Yeah. The 5th. Um, can we review that and sure. at the call of the chair, please? Sure. So uh, we will, is there a motion to adjourn um, to... Um, Um, to the next, uh, well, it would be uh, to April 5th, 2000, special meeting of April 5th, 2016, unless uh, we need a um, meeting earlier, which will be at the call of the chair. Is there a motion? So moved. All a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Meeting adjourned. Thank you. You're